So the first wave of anti-evolutionism involved a crusade to ban the teaching of evolution in America's public schools. And this is well under its way in the 1920s under the leadership of William Jennings Bryan, who you see there in uh, Tennessee. The ACLU recruited a young teacher named John Thomas Scopes to serve as the defendant in a test case of <coughs> Tennessee's Butler Act in Dayton, Tennessee. Now, during the trial, Bryan, who was a former Secretary of State, by the way, and a three-time presidential candidate, he articulated, even if he didn't invent, what had been dubbed as the three pillars of creationism, which have served as a sturdy platform for anti-evolution efforts from 1925 onward. And these are that evolution is unsupported science, a theory in crisis, to use a popular phrase, tottering on the verge of empirical collapse, and the only reason um, the scientists haven't fessed up to it is because, say, they're heavily invested in it. Uh, second, that evolution is incompatible with religion, or if you push a little with Christianity, or if you push a little more with true Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> and um, third, that it's only fair for both sides, that is, evolution and the biblical account of creation, or creation science, or intelligent design, as the case may be, only fair for both sides to be taught. Now, Scopes was convicted, to no one's surprise. But his conviction was overturned on appeal, and the state declined to prosecute him again. So did he win, really? Not really. The winners were really the creationists, despite the fact that their champion, Brian, died shortly after the trial, and despite the hammering that they took from the big city newspapers covering the trial. So why was it a win for the creationists? Because evolution disappeared from the textbooks. And it disappeared from the textbooks because textbook publishers feared controversy, and teachers followed suit. This was something that was not really widely recognized. A Broadway play based on the Scopes trial opened in 1955, and this is a still, of course, from the 1960 movie version, Inherit the Wind, with uh, Spencer Tracy as the Darrow character, Fred Merch as the uh, Brian character. Now, Inherit the Wind is loosely based on the Scopes trial, and it's loosely based on it because uh, Lawrence and Lee, the authors, were treating creationism as a dead issue, suitable as a metaphor for treating a live issue, McCarthyism, in the same way our familiars of the crucible used witchcraft, a dead issue, to talk about McCarthyism as a live issue. And really the whole creationism evolution issue was in abeyance until the late 1950s. What happens then? The Soviet Union launches split. The United States realizes that there's a space race on, realizes that needs to uh, improve science education, pours money into it. Well, if you improve science education, you end up improving biology education, you end up improving evolution education, and as a result, for the first time in a long time, you have serious PhD biologists helping to write textbooks. And evolution gets in. Darwin is back with a vengeance. Accurate and up-to-date information about evolution is in the classroom. And the anti-evolution legislation of the 1920s is being ignored, repealed, the Tennessee legislature finally repealed the Butler Act in 1967, and finally challenged in court. Here you have Susan Epperson, a young high school bi biology teacher in Arkansas, who was asked by the Arkansas Education Association to be a plaintiff in a case challenging Arkansas's anti-evolution law which is actually a very interesting law because that's the only one I know of that was established by initiative. Which is a legislative, but that was the whole state voting on it. Now, the text Susan Epperson had been told by her school district to use, uh, Modern Biology by uh, Otto and Towel, which is the descendant of a textbook that had been stripped of human evolution after the scope strata. Uh, there's human evolution in a textbook. She's supposed to use the textbook, and there's a state law telling her not to use the textbook because it presents evolution. But, so Epperson sues, asserting that the statute violates your constitutional rights. The case wound its way to the Supreme Court, which made quick work of it. So with evolution back in the textbooks, and with legal barriers to its teaching being removed, uh, being removed or falling under challenge, we then enter the next stage of anti-evolution activity, seeking equal time. It's no longer possible to ban evolution, so what are you going to do if you're a creationist? You're going to ask for creationism to be taught. 
And something called creation science uh, is developed. Uh, here are two of the leading figures, uh, Henry Morris, now dead, and Wayne Gish, still alive, both at the Institute of Creation Research. So what is creation science, or scientific creationism? Well, it's a bunch of doctrines based on a particular narrow, literal reading of Genesis, for which scientific support is claimed. That the universe and the Earth are about 6,000, at a stretch, maybe 10,000 years old, <coughs> That living things were specially created by God to reproduce after their own kind, meaning that evolution across kinds is impossible, and that Noah's flood was a historic worldwide event responsible for most of the fossil record and for geological features like the Grand Canyon. There are a lot of there are a lot of young earth creationist groups out there. One of the oldest is the Institute for Creation Research. The uh, Creation Research Society aspires to be the scholarly arm of the movement. Answers in Genesis, now the largest, is, uh, was founded by a cadre of Australian and New Zealander fans of ICR. It's now headquartered in Petersburg, Kentucky, where in 2007 it opened a multi-million dollar creation science museum across the river from Cincinnati. Um, Answers in Genesis is generally uh, rasher and more interested in um, evangelism and science, so given the competition that's by comparison. Uh, young Earth creationism remains the dominant form of anti-evolutionism today, and um, these, this is sort of the more reputable branch of it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I forgot to put on the slide, but for example, one well-known Young Earth creation evangelist, Kent Holbein, is currently a guest of the federal government. <laughs> a 10-year sentence for tax evasion. Um, what I did remember the slide for, because it's more photogenic, is the pamphleteer Jack T. Schick who's a big daddy tract as a charming anti-Semitic caricature of a frothing and sweaty evolution teaching professor who, of course, is rounded by a clean-cut creationist. <laughs> available in uh, faculties everywhere. Right? Now, there were widespread attempts to require equal time for creation science, something like 37 separate pieces of legislation. And two of these attempts, one in Arkansas and one in Louisiana, were successful. The Arkansas law was ruled unconstitutional in a landmark trial in McLean v. Arkansas in 1982, including expert witnesses for the plaintiffs, such as Francisco Ayala, Brent Dalrymple, and uh, Stephen J. Gould. And so devastating was this defeat that the state decided not to appeal the decision from the federal district court. The Louisiana bill uh, eventually did reach the Supreme Court, which ruled in um, Edwards v. Aguilar in 1987 that teaching creationism in the public schools violates the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. So what now? Thus begins the third phase of anti-evolution uh, in the United States. Two new strategies emerged. One was the idea of further disinfecting creationism, which, remember, had already been renamed scientific creationism or creation science. So further disinfecting creationism of its overtly religious content. Such innovations as abrupt appearance theory and initial appearance theory swiftly came and went. The version with the most staying power was something called intelligent design, um, which has as its de facto institutional headquarters an outfit in Seattle called the Discovery Institute, whose uh, logo did not just be very subtle about this. That's my <laughs> God and some DNA in for Adam. 